Welcome to the Block Time Podcast, powered by Riot Platforms, where we take a deep dive into topics around Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, the grid, and energy. Today, we've got David Schatz, Senior Vice President of Operations at Riot. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Um, so I uh, wanted to have you on to talk about lots of different uh, topics um, but first, I, I want to start with kind of what, what your journey's been like uh, career-wise and, and Bitcoin-wise that, that, that you're now uh, here, you know, with the senior role at Riot. Yeah, absolutely. So um, started off my career, um, I'm a very mechanical person, uh, technically inclined. So started off my career working on uh, cars, actually, at a dealership. Um, and when the economy kind of uh, took a dive in 2008, 2009, I decided to make a switch to something a little more stable. Um, did a lot of research and found that um, getting on with a, a government or city job in the same field would be pretty lucrative, uh, which can potentially come with, you know, a um, um, pension. Uh, so found, found an avenue for that. Um, when I got hired on with, with the state of Oregon, um, uh, went through their heavy-duty diesel apprenticeship and then uh, worked on city buses for about uh, eight years. Um, when there was an opportunity for the railroad uh, to open up, I transferred over to, to that side of the house and uh, worked on locomotives for, for a few more years. Wow. That, I, I think that that is every childhood dream is working on diesel locomotives uh, mm -hmm. based, based on conversations with my five-year-old son. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, I've had the opportunity to learn about diesel locomotives because, you know, that's the kind of book that, that, that we read. I didn't know that um, the diesel motor is actually generating electricity for electric motors mm -hmm. that are actually moving the Ab locomotive. Absolutely, yeah. So you've got a whole system kind of contained in, into that, um, which I, probably lends itself to to where your career took you uh, on the electricity side. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the uh, the buses are just a traditional diesel motor. Is that mm -hmm. uh, and how many uh, is that like a V eight? Oh, it's an inline six. Yep. Yeah, inline there's, six. There's okay. a couple different configurations, but um, they also have electric buses now too. We when I was working, we were just piloting uh, a few different models of the articulated uh, electric buses. But yeah, inline six Cummins makes an engine, um, and Cat also makes a couple couple different options. Some of the older ones were a Detroit diesel, and they were a, a massive uh, inline four cylinder. Wow. Um, yeah. When I lived in New York City, I commuted on a bus every day with with one of those giant engines uh, right behind me. Um, Fascinating, and uh, the the battery seems challenging uh, given the it's heavy, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that Elon Musk will come out with a yes. Tesla bus. He'll figure something out. Yeah. <laughs> David, what's one thing that you remember from that that job opportunity working with the government and, and diesel mechanics and all that? Uh, you know, they spent a lot of time on training um, and process, uh, so just really had an opportunity to get an understanding of how to plan um, for very large projects. Um, and, and really organize. That sounds like something that you've carried over into working with Riot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of planning and organization that goes into uh, running a Bitcoin mine, building and running a Bitcoin mine. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, and so uh, what, what kind of uh, projects were there either on, on the bus or locomotive side? Was it about a, kind of the size of the fleet that, that you were maintaining? Absolutely. So on, on the bus side, I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of buses. So uh, very technical as far as tracking um, maintenance, what's coming up for what, as well as mitigating all of the issues that happen on the line um, on a daily basis. Obviously, a 24-hour operation, uh, you could have anywhere between 50 to 200 buses a day that are coming into the shop to get repaired, um, to, to need to be repaired to go out the next day. Uh, we had a contingency fleet, but obviously not hundreds. Uh, right. <laughs> so a lot of work and a lot of planning going on to... to uh, mitigate the, the daily issues as well as uh, keep up with the, the planned maintenance. And, and the, the maintenance, I mean, I imagine you, you want to avoid having the bus break down with people in it. That's kind of like the the failure scenario. Uh, so there's a lot of like preventive maintenance to try to avoid that, that outcome. Absolutely. Um, constantly changing uh, air brake systems ahead of time, uh, fluid flushes ahead of time, changing, you know, the failure parts way before, um, we see an issue. Um, 
because we were operating for such a long time and, and very similar fleets, we're able to kind of project, you know, when a fuel pump's going to go out, when a starter's going to go out. We're, we're able to find that end of life and, and do maintenance before we get to that point. And what kind of uh, diesel motor is in a locomotive? Uh, there's a couple different options as well. Uh, there's Cummins. Uh, there's Detroit. Uh, massive, massive engines. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, 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 I love that. Uh, and uh, over by Rockdale, we have a, uh, um, a train uh, track that, that goes through that area. Mm -hmm. And so I've had quite a few occasions of getting to drive side by side with the train yeah. on the highway, um, including with my son. When we went out to the yeah. Rockdale Fair, we got to uh, drive with the train. And yeah. uh, those are massive, massive pieces of yeah. equipment. Um, is, is the... Is the size of the parts, does that make it easier or harder to maintain? I would say it's much more difficult. Um, yeah. you've, you've got some some components that are extremely big. I mean, a driveline, uh, for instance, can can be a couple hundred pounds. Uh, and when you're, you're, you're working in a pit, right, so you drive these trains into a shop and you're working in a pit underneath them, it can be very tricky to try and maneuver some of the parts out. Uh, we often find ourselves uh, manufacturing equipment to help us remove parts uh oh so, wow yeah. okay uh, very technical <laughs> and, and, and safety wise yeah yeah that's the other thing uh working in both a union and and for a state organization uh safety is the utmost priority uh, and that's kind of what we we uh have adopted in the riot culture as well so i do find it interesting that you were drawn towards kind of a low risk uh kind of career direction and then you ended up in bitcoin mining <laughs> Uh, so, so where, where'd you go after the, the diesel locomotives? Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I, at some point, um, towards the end of my career there, uh, at, at working on the, the locomotives, I decided that I, I had kind of a knack for management. I enjoyed helping people. Um, I wanted to kind of look for some opportunities to help bring people up, right. And, and improve them as, as employees and as people within the community. Um, and, Started taking classes to, to do that. Uh, I actually uh, earned a certificate of management at, at the company that I worked at. Uh, I was the first union employee to actually achieve that, so it was pretty exciting for me. I did it all on my own time. It took me about a year and a half to get. Um, around that same time, I uh, met some folks uh, that I became very close friends with when I was on vacation, and uh, they happened to have just a few Bitcoin miners running, mm -hmm. running in an office and introduced me to Bitcoin. Um, I got a pretty in-depth understanding of it and went down the rabbit hole and, and realized how cool it was and, and wanted to be a part of it. And an opportunity arose for us to kind of start a little side business um, doing this Bitcoin mining, start a small company that I could now start using my skills that I learned to coach people and, and build something, right, and, and be a part of an exciting startup. So uh, I, opted, I opted to um, uh, leave the company that I was at and went full force into this, this new venture. All right, that, that raised way more questions than it answered. Uh, <laughs> first, I'll start with where, where do you think the knack for management came from? You know, I, I really have an enjoyment just for fixing things. I like to find problems, and I like, I like to fix problems. And I think being a mechanic really, uh, you know, emphasized that. And it was never boring. I, I never had a dull day. And then, you know, moving into the management, it's very similar, right? We, we look for problems throughout the day within our processes and our and our procedures and and work to, to just fix them so it's just a different type of being a mechanic but humans are not machines that is How, correct uh so what yeah what, what are the challenges you've seen versus you know fixing mechanical problems versus uh, people problems yeah so fixing mechanical problems is really easy right you identify a part you just swap it out <laughs> if you have the part if, if you, you have, have if, if if yeah yeah with people, um, it's really just uh, trying to get understand their perspective, right, and working with them to help find a solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like it's it's both about it's it's the the communication part. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're trying to diagnose a mechanical problem, you're trying to get the machine to speak to you. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. In, in, indirectly, yeah. uh, find some error codes or whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Same, same kind of concept with humans. Same people. concept, which you can get some actual real-time feedback. So yeah. So it's, it's much easier. Yes. <laughs> um, and, okay, so um, then my, my other question was, um, you met these folks while you were on vacation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> randomly randomly on vacation. Met a couple people that I kind of just clicked with and became close friends. And uh, amongst, a, I'll say, several months to a year, um, kind of started to get into this, this Bitcoin rabbit hole. 
and just went from there. And David, what year was that 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 you met those folks? Uh, that was 2017. Okay, oh. so yeah, Bitcoin had moved around a little bit by then. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So for our audience, if you're ever on vacation, keep in mind it might be a big career <laughs> <Yeah>. opportunity. <laughs> you never know. Take a vacation. You might. Yeah, have you need a to be networking change. when you're on vacation. All right. <laughs> Don't just sit there on the beach. Yeah. You need to be shaking hands, <laughs> talking to people. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Um, and and so um, when 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 um, this this was in Louisiana. Yes, that's correct. Um, and so at that point, did you decide to, to move from Portland uh, to Louisiana? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I um, uh, you know, thought about it over a week or two and uh, just decided, hey, it's, it's now or never. Um, so I put in my notice at, at my company. Um, unfortunately, walked away too early to get my pension. Yeah. I was about uh, nine, nine and a half years uh, into employment and 10 years as pension, pension vesting. So walked away from that, but uh, paid off tenfold. Right, right, yeah. When when you see the right opportunity, you gotta seize it. Um, and what was some of the reactions from some of the coworkers and friends you developed? Uh, it, it, were were they like, David, you've lost your mind? Yeah, yeah. Several several uh, were like, man, you've lost your mind. You've got a pension. You've got a good job here. Uh, you could be here for the rest of your life. Um, and and I I took some of that to heart. Uh, but also, you know, I, I was I was I'll say 26, 25, 26 at the time. And know that I could always fall back, fall back on that, right? I, yeah. I'd, I'd achieved the point in my career that I could get hired at any any um, diesel shop or, or within any kind of city city work. Um, so I was like, hey, if, if this doesn't work out, I always have an opportunity to go back. On the flip side, this opportunity isn't going to come up again. Yeah, I uh, I imagine that every everywhere in the world there's a diesel engine. That is correct. <laughs> right? uh, so that's interesting. Actually, you know, this raises a question. Uh, what is the difference between a diesel engine and kind of regular gasoline engine that people use in their car? Yes. Yeah, so a, a diesel engine um, runs off of far more compression. Um, the The amount of compression in the in the cylinder is what actually generates that um, inertia and heat, which causes the explosion. Um, whereas in a gasoline engine, you've got you know a spark plug or some sort of ignition that's lighting that fuel air mixture to cause that explosion in the combustion chamber to to move that cylinder. And so ultimately, that's how you just get more energy out of the motor uh, to to power the vehicle. Okay. Yeah, more torque in the diesel and no spark plugs. That's that's all I know from being a kid with uh, with go karts and diesel trucks around. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and you go from like a gasoline engine, for example, can have you know maybe 50 to 100 psi fuel pressure and in and in a diesel engine you're looking at 10,000 oh, 15 wow. 20,000 pounds of pressure it's a different order uh, of magnitude yes yeah. okay that's amazing um fascinating okay so you you moved to to louisiana uh after a couple of weeks of deliberation yeah uh um and you know it's it's interesting because um People will look at the Bitcoin industry and sometimes you'll hear remarks of like, you guys got lucky. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, a lot of risks were taken by a lot of different people along the way. That is correct. Uh, the, and sometimes those risks did not pan out. Sometimes they did. And mm -hmm. and it worked out, you know, thanks thanks to God. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, th I feel like uh, the, the, there's an element of luck, mm -hmm. just like in poker, right? There's yeah. an element of luck. But you don't become a professional poker player by luck. Correct. It takes skill. Correct. Yeah. It takes skill and determination. Yeah, and and a willingness to take on risks that other people will not take on. Absolutely. They'll 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 stay working for the city for exactly. six more months. Yes. Yeah. Be comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Get that pension. Yeah. <laughs> David, I wanted to ask, what was it about Bitcoin and and the people that you met that really pushed you over the edge to take that leap of faith? I mean, like you mentioned, you had a pension coming mm -hmm. within a half a year. What was the deciding factor? What was like what really stood out to you about this new opportunity? Yeah, I think the technology, um, you know, still coming in, come in somewhat late. It was still a pretty early industry, um, and it just I, I found it very exciting. Um, I, I believe in it, um, and then having the opportunity to come in and kind of do a startup company and build it from the scratch, where we could treat the people the way we wanted to treat them, offer the opportunities we wanted to offer, and not have anybody else from the outside saying no, you can't do this. Um, it was very intriguing to me. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, you know, because be, being kind of in an early company environment, you get to build the processes 
Whereas I imagine at the city, things were pretty well laid out when, yeah. when you joined. I, uh, I don't know when diesel engines started, probably <laughs> early 1930s. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, being at a company that's that's that old, right, it, it's very hard to change processes and procedures. A lot of the stuff is set in place. Uh, and, and you've got, you know, hundreds to thousands of people at a company, and there's just a lot of, of things that have to move to make something happen. Yeah. So. So um, that was exciting. Now, in Louisiana, I think that – how many megawatts did you all develop? Um, I think it was in the, in the ballpark of around seven, seven yeah. megawatts running. Mm-hmm. Which uh, is, is tremendous scale for – I mean, in any context, right? I, 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 it's, that's a lot of electricity. Uh, and then um, h- h- how did you end up going from Louisiana to Texas? Yeah, so great question. Um, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of failures happened in Louisiana. I'll emphasize the word failures. A um, lot of poor planning, right, as we're learning this thing. Um, so we got in some situations where we, we didn't do enough due diligence with the power company, with some of these contracts we'd signed. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the power company could not deliver on what was promised, and we had to find a solution. At this point, we'd grown big enough to where we had customers that we had had you know, signed agreements with and made promises to. So um, it the option was either to close shop, right, or be too stubborn to quit and uh, just keep on, you know, charging forward. And so, uh, you know, obviously we're not quitters, right? So we just kept on charging forward. That was the, the obvious decision. Um, so full steam ahead, looked for other solutions, um, found a solution uh, where we are at now in Rockdale, Texas. There was other failure solutions along the way that didn't work out, but ultimately led us to Rockdale. Um, which which was an op- awesome opportunity, um, and we restarted. Uh, so we, we basically closed all the operations down there, um, moved all of our employees that, that wanted to stick with us uh, to Texas, and restarted from scratch again. And, and it was a forest, right? Or it was yeah. just like yeah. – and before the environmentalists get on my case, <laughs> these are these are ash junipers, right? Yes. These are cedars. Yes, yes. <laughs> there's, yeah. they're not an endangered. <laughs> no, species. it's not they're an invasive species. Exactly. <laughs> we did we did the world a favor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want mulch? You don't yeah, exactly. want these trees here. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, y'all had to to, to clear that. Uh, it was kind of a greenfield development. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the first phase was was about a hundred acre um, greenfield development that we cleared um, and then started building on. And and what was the most appealing part about that location in particular? Yeah, so right across the road from our property is the is the Sandow switch, which is a very large switching station that was already built. The infrastructure is already there. Um, it was previously built and, and um, operated by Alcoa, uh, which was no longer operating in business. So it was literally just sitting there available for us to use and allowed us to get online much quicker to mitigate the issues that we had in, in Louisiana that the power company couldn't build a substation for us. Got it. Um, and then y'all just started building, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So um, we, we essentially uh, bought a bunch of shipping containers and sent them there so we could have a warehouse to work in and we could have a place to store materials and started hiring people. Um, so the first building was Building A? That's correct, yep. Uh, as the name implies, I, yep. I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, so w- what was kind of uh, d- driving the, the uh, how y'all wanted to the scale at which you wanted to build mm-hmm. um, versus kind of what had been built in Louisiana. Yes. Yeah, so um, we knew that, that with the, uh, the available power that we had and with our customer, we know what size they wanted to build to. Um, and we had the opportunity there with, with not having a space constraint or um, a, a power constraint that we would start with these two buildings, A and B. Um, we did them pretty close back to back, working on the slabs at roughly the same time and, and all of the racking. Um, and then, it was just going to be wait for the next customer and, and yeah try and build from there. Uh, and, and essentially kind of being an a institutional hosting uh, uh, provider. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ha- ha- how did that change when uh, Riot came along? Uh, and, and, yeah, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on, on that transaction. Yeah, so, so that was a very exciting uh, transaction. Riot initially came out um, with talks to do some hosting, um, and they were going to be a potential customer. Um, had a few different meetings with them and talks with them and realized, hey, this is a group of people that has the same mindset as us, right? We have this understanding of how to build infrastructure and um, how to manage uh, these sites and how to, to, to run them. And then they had a completely different skill set as far as raising capital, how to 
really have a corporate structure of, of these processes and procedures and can provide all this extra input of skill sets we don't have. So we kind of changed the conversation and said, hey, this could be a potential partnership. Would you be interested in, in an acquisition? And then we would kind of come on board as your management team. Yeah. Um, and essentially continue doing what you were doing. Absolutely. Uh, with with a, just a big backing. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and and that, that led to the development of the immersion uh, buildings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and kind of what was the, the change of philosophy from air-cooled to immersion at that point, uh, buildings F and G? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we had been playing with the immersion um, since the start of the company. Well, I'll say 2018, we'd started with a fish tank. You know, we put some immersion fluid in it and got a, a, a radiator off of, of um, Amazon for a you know, 1990 Honda Civic and got this pump and had all this little thing running in the office. Um, so it was very neat technology. Um, it was new for the Bitcoin world. Uh, and we've been diving down this rabbit hole for, for several months to, to years uh, looking into this. And um, when, when Riot came along, the acquisition happened. We obviously were going to build buildings for Riot. We said, hey, we've gone down this immersion road. Immersion is the future. We've, we've done a ton of research on it. We haven't had the capital to do it. But we're telling you this is this is the way to go. And, and Riot, obviously being innovators as well, quickly bought in and said, hey, let's do this thing. Um, let's, let's design a system um, and, and come up with something and let's deploy it. So basically the idea is spend some more money up front. Mm-hmm. Spend some more time up front, yep. and then over the life of the asset, you're going to have less maintenance, yep. more controllability, mm-hmm. reliability, mm-hmm. Uh, and thus ultimately a better return on the investment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and longer lasting machines because yeah. the environment you're, you're controlling them in. Absolutely. Right. Which is particularly important to Texas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and during, yeah. During those hot and and when you've got thousands and thousands of these machines, you want to optimize um, uh, their reliability. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd be really curious uh, on on the dry cooler side, um, you know, the, the kind of the the thinking on how, how to develop a cooling system for the immersion, because mm-hmm. the immersion is really only half the picture right mm-hmm. inside the building. Correct. The other half of the picture is what's going on outside the building. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've you've the, the main thing is to get the heat out of the machines. Right. So the, the philosophy of of. Uh, immersion is you've got machines submerged in a bathtub of, of oil um, for you know, layman's terms, and you need some way to extract that heat from the oil. So so our system, we have a heat exchanger that runs a bunch of, of plumbing through that system, and on you've got oil on one side, and you have water on the other side that runs out to a dry cooler. So you've got cold water coming in, capturing that heat out of the oil, taking it outside to the dry cooler to have the, the fans pull the heat out of the water, and then comes back in and, and adds that cooling loop. And, and in our opinion... Um, not having oil run through that cooler, it mitigates any any environmental risks. You know, w- with having a large scale operation in this equipment, there's always a potential to have some sort of leak. And again, our our main philosophy being safety, we want to make sure we're, we're protecting the environment, right? We're, we want to be good stewards of our community. So keeping that water loop on the outside and keeping that oil on the inside and designing to build our buildings as a containment in the event that we do have some sort of catastrophic failure, we're able to capture it all inside and not release anything into the environment. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, and it seems like, you know, we, we talked about the, the financial advantage of, uh, of immersion, but there's an environmental advantage as well of reducing e-waste, yep. um, of increasing the efficiency, the cooling efficiency is, is better uh, versus uh, air-cooled. Um, and then also, uh, perhaps also reducing water consumption. Mm-hmm. I know that if we, if we start looking at other cooling systems like HVAC and mm-hmm. chillers, you're talking about massive use of water, Absolutely. Um, swimming pools and swimming pools of water. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> the dry cooler, the the water is in a closed loop. Yep, it's it's all sealed, contained. Um, do we? But th- there's also an opportunity sometimes to use the to evaporate the water with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how to say the word. Mm-hmm. Adiabatic. Yep, yep. Adiabatic. You got it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we, we also have a, a we'll call it a backup um, adiabatic system that in super hot weather that we see here in Texas, um, we'll run that adi- adiabatic system and run, run water um, basically down the cooling fins of that dry cooler to, to give us an, a delta of, of the ambient temperature to, to help supplement um, the heat that we've got to try and pull out of those machines. And and yeah to yeah maximize the efficiency of of the overall operation. Yep. 
Um, so I, I'm curious when when the facility evolved from purely being a construction site mm -hmm. to also being an operational site. Yeah. Um, did, is that how? Did, do you feel like your your role transformed, or that you were? It, it was always just operations, and so you know it was just continuation. Yeah, absolutely. It did. It did, it did transform. Um, you know, going and, and constructing something is one thing, but then when you're going to operate it and maintain it, it, it's a it's a different ball game, right? And people often think that oh, we've built this large Bitcoin mine with all these miners in there that run by themselves. You don't have any employees uh, doing things, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. We have roughly 220 employees at the Rockdale facility that range from minor maintenance that are, are fixing the machines on a regular basis. We have our pump team that are fixing all the pumps that, that run our heat exchangers under the tanks. We've got our evaporative cooling team. These evaporative coolers have to be serviced and maintained to prevent issues. Uh, we've got our uh, construction teams that are coming by, continuously making improvements to the systems. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, happening on a regular basis. And then we also have, you know, data center that are the ones servicing the machines, pulling them out of the tanks, putting better machines in, and then sending them off to repair at some of our other other areas within the site. Yeah, every time I go out there, it kind of feels like uh, an ant colony almost yes. of like <laughs> everyone working together towards a shared purpose. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting that it, there is still um, construction and improvements happening. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, like, I don't really see any end to it in the sense that as long as we're always learning mm -hmm. and looking to improve, there's going to be work that is is meaningful and is going to you know in increase the efficiency of the facility, uh, the size or scope or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, that we're always going to have a need to, to hire you know lots of folks, uh, whether it's in in Rockdale or in Corsicana. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. Uh, we're constantly right we're never satisfied with the status quo right we're always innovating we're always trying to improve and, and it's with everything you mentioned that you know improving some of the buildings uh, just the other day our electricians came up with an idea to to add photocell lights to some of our buildings that are leds that are more efficient they turn off when somebody's not in the building you walk in and they turn on you know like yeah. a hospital it's, it's pretty neat it's just constantly people are always thinking about ways to make things improve and then and to increase efficiency and, and save power <laughs> Yeah, that's good. We don't want to waste electricity no. as Bitcoin no. miners. That's uh, <laughs> terrible. Um, the the other is that uh, there's always going to be a need for maintenance. Yes. I mean, it's funny how we don't hear this argument about, um, oh, once you build the bus, then mm -hmm. you don't need to hire anybody to maintain the bus. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Nobody's making that argument. Yeah. Uh, it works for a few weeks until you get a flat tire, and then what do you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and as much as, you know, we'd, we'd like for everything to be 100% reliable and never yeah. break down, yeah. that's just not the reality not of our reality. physical world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, and we're pushing, pushing a lot of this, this um, uh, equipment to the max, right? So we want to be proactive with these maintenance intervals of where we're cleaning breakers, we're torquing connections, we're walking around with um, thermal uh, imaging to, to check switch gear and these kind of things to make sure that we're, we're being proactive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then there's the scale of it, mm -hmm. right? That when you've got a hundred thousand mining rigs, mm -hmm. uh, you tell me how many pumps? Uh, yeah. Yeah, hundreds of pumps. Hundreds. Yeah. Uh, there's just the law of large numbers. Like yeah. something's going to, and it's going to get weirder and weirder, right? Yes. As as you yes. fix kind of the easy low hanging fruit, yeah. then it's like more complicated uh, uh, problems will crop up. Yeah. There there is. It's always interesting. There's never been a day where we're sitting there twiddling our thumbs looking for work to do. I'll tell you that. <laughs> right. Um, so lately, it's been about building a G and bringing that mm -hmm. back up. Uh, we've replaced the dry coolers yep. there, um, and uh, kind of you know we we just had our monthly update. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous increase. I think it was twenty five percent increase. So mm -hmm. um, clearly reflective of all the hard work that's going on on the ground to yep. get those results. So, I mean, congratulations to you and your team on on getting those results. Super impressive going into the year end here. Yeah, thank you. They they're very excited. A lot of people have been working very hard for a long time to get to get these things back online and and approve a lot of these things. So it's very impressive to see. And so I'm curious, uh, what's your kind of management philosophy in terms of like motivating folks to 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 get those results? Yeah. So um, really, the motivation comes with the people, right? 
Um, I think that, that the philosophy is we look to hire people that are smarter than us, right? I, I, I don't want to be telling somebody what to do. I, I want somebody to tell me what to do, right, yeah. or, what, or what they want to do. So really the motivation comes from allowing people to have their own ideas on how things should run, right? So it, it's my job to ask a lot of questions and make sure we're, we're, we're forecasting and thinking about all the problems that could arise from something. But as far as improving the systems and maintaining the systems and, and, and in implementing new ideas, it, it all comes from the team members. And that's what keeps them motivated because they own it, right? Right. Uh, kind of the bottoms up grassroots uh, approach. Um, Absolutely. And, and then um, as, as you, what's kind of been the most gratifying aspect of, of having this, this senior leadership role mm -hmm. um, and, and leading so many people? Oh, man, I'll tell you. Uh, seeing some of the folks that have started off in some of the entry-level position over the years, you know, back in 2019, 2020, and watching them progress, like being able to utilize their skill sets uh, and move them around within the company, find their niche, right, and watch them move up from a supervisor to a manager to a director to some even VPs. We've had some folks that have started off in entry level or now a VP of the company. Um, so very exciting watching people be able to, to purchase their first home, or yeah. their first car, um, get training that they wouldn't get an opportunity in another company. Some of the electricians that we've able to, to put through apprenticeship programs, um, that kind of stuff is, is very exciting to me. First motorcycle. First motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> first new motorcycle, I'll say that. Yeah. Some, some first bank account, yeah. right? We have the... You go to do direct faucet, and they're like, "I don't have a bank account." I'm like, "This is exciting. Yeah. Like, let let me help you with that." Yeah. That's, like, that's the kind of stuff I love. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, although as a Bitcoin company, we no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we got to boycott the banks. Uh, no, no, it, you know the the economic opportunity afforded to people is is just amazing, and it's kind of uh, you know we used to talk about like you start out as like the mailroom clerk, and then yeah. like you work your way up like you know to the top floor of yeah. uh, your CEO and. What, what what kind of uh, roles would you say are kind of the mailroom clerk equivalent uh, at a Bitcoin mining company? Yeah, so a lot of those would be probably like a um, entry level data center technician, right? Where you're starting off helping to unbox miners when they come in, um, when you're helping to do a lot of the cleaning and maintenance. Um, that's one. We've got some of our more entry level um, inventory positions where they're kind of moving equipment from racks, getting things ready to deploy. Um, but how we structure it is within every department, there's an entry-level position, right, to get somebody interested to try it. So electrical, to be an electrician, we've got an entry-level position. Inventory, we have an entry-level. Administration, we have entry-level. HR, we have entry-level. Security, we have entry-level. Safety, we have entry-level. And within each one of those, just to name a few, we've, we've got opportunities for growth um, to, to go from one year or, or day one to, to year 10, right? Yeah. And and constantly working with the leaders in those departments to keep raising that shelf so there's never a glass ceiling. That's fantastic. Um, and uh, in terms of, of hiring and recruiting, um, how, how do you think, has that been a, a challenge in Rockdale or um, is, have you really been able to find a great talent pool? Yeah, we've really been able to find a good talent pool. I mean, there's tons of, tons of um, industry professionals um, in Rockdale that, we, that we've been able to bring in. Some folks for some of the more specialized positions um, we've we've pulled in from other surrounding cities, but a lot of them have ended up moving to Rockdale. They love the job so much and they love the town. A lot of them moved there. So I'd say 90 to 95 percent of our workforce are Rockdale or, or Milam County residents. Yeah. And and that I, I think that's translated into like a lot of really like community activities yeah. where um, Riot and, and the people of Riot are really – at the forefront of like giving back to the community and, and building up kind of everything from, I think, stadium lights to yep. uh, toy drives and yep. uh, Christmas trees. Yeah, we set up the, the Christmas tree in town every year with our crane and our teams love doing that. You know, it, they're able to set it up and then they're going to go celebrate the lighting of the Christmas tree with their kids and they can say, hey, I actually helped set this up. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we volunteer a lot at the, at the local um, animal shelter, making improvements there. Um, and so, yeah, we're just very injected in the community. Um, most of them work for us, right, and, yeah. and work at Riot. So it's just, it's just great. That's fantastic. Um, and, and do you feel like there's things that, that we learned from uh, Rockdale that we're now applying in Corsicana? You want yeah. to go through those? Yeah, absolutely. So really just spending time to, to, um, with the community, right, to understand what's the need of the community, 
what what does the city of Corsicana want to see from a from a large company coming into town like us, right? It's easy to just go in and build something, um, but we want to be a part of the community. That's how you, you you get things done and you get the right people. We we are a large company, but we want to operate like a family. So we don't want to force anything, right? We want we want to come in and, and we want everybody to want us there. So really, it's spending a lot of time with the community, spending a lot of time with the city, understanding what they need, how we can help, how they can help us spending time with the local police to force. Hey, what concerns do you have with having so many people come into the town? Is there things that we can do to, to help supplement your concerns? So yeah, just a lot of that. Lessons learned from Rockdale. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, Gabe, did you have any questions? I mean, I, I kind of wanted to go back to what the um, what the changes have been. So when you started out in Louisiana, mm -hmm. you know, you obviously didn't have 220 employees. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you got to Rockdale, you know, you, you guys were in a building mindset of we have to build this facility and then maintain it. But now how has your role changed in, in the sense of what you're focused on and, and where your time really goes to? Yeah, that's a great question. So initially, um, the focus was let's hire 100 people in a week. <laughs> I mean, I, I exaggerate a little bit. It was really, you know, several weeks to a month. Um, but we went from from, you know, zero to 100 people very quickly. Uh, and it was just build, build, build. Um, and within that, you know, if you, if you move too fast, there's a lot of rework, right? There's a lot of coming back and fixing mistakes that you made uh, to accomplish that. So now my, my role is really forecasting, right? Finding out we, we know what we're building, we know what the direction of the company is, how do we improve what we have continuously and what do we need to scale for for the future build? So what does our safety department need to look like from 50 people to 500 people? What does it need to look like in five years? What do we need? What foundations do we need to build right now as far as our processes and procedures to accommodate what we're going to be in five years? So we're not coming back and doing rework. So right. so a lot of that, a lot of a lot of planning, a lot of prep work, um, improving processes and, and procedures. And I wanted to point out now that it's like with Riot, we have such a large, you know, executive structure, such a, a you know, a big team as far as lawyers and, um, you know, accounting and all that kind of stuff. And and how does that look for you, you know, having come from just a small team of I, I've heard it described as like run and gun, you know, very quick mm -hmm. thinking to now we have such a large structure and so many people that work um, behind the scenes to make sure that the company is efficient and, and does what it needs to do and due diligence. Yeah, for me, it's super exciting um, having the opportunity to sit, like you said, with lawyers and investment bankers mm -hmm. and um, CFOs and accountants and public and policy, public policy yeah. and all these things. I can just soak up information, right? I don't have any experience in any of those fields. So to be able to sit sit around with people that are like minded with me that are, are you know, at the, the highest point in their field and I can learn from them. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. And I feel like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It doesn't, doesn't come very often. Yeah. Uh, and that they're on our side. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like, you always wow. put lawyers on your yeah. side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. there, there's been many moments where I'm yeah. like, I, I'm so grateful Williams yeah. on our side yes. and not on theirs <laughs> yes. or Brian's on our side. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I think this is something else to, that is really important about Riot is that, um, because, we're a publicly traded professional company that has access to capital. We've been able to build during the bear market, mm -hmm. whereas some of our other competitors, maybe they had to sell in the bear yep. market, right, or back out. Um, yeah, how, how do you think that that's an advantage of, of being able to do that? Yeah, for us, it comes back to the planning aspect, right? So we know where we want to be, where we want to be in five years, and I'll say I'll use Corsican as an example of that. Uh, we really built Corsicana in a bear market, right, when we first started it or when the plans were happening. So when a bear market happens, obviously the supply chain that was really constrained isn't so constrained anymore. Materials are now cheaper. They're more available. Uh, you know, a lot of the electrical equipment often we're waiting uh, six months to two years to get it once you've placed an order. So for us, when we see a bear market coming, like, okay, well, we know we're trying to get here. This is the perfect time. We're going to get the best deals. We're going to work with all the vendors. We have now a slew of option of vendors that aren't saying, now nah, we don't want to talk with you because we've got these other six things lined up. We don't need you. Uh, it, it's very exciting for us because we can we can build those relationships, get that catered experience, and then order materials in the quantities we want and at a, and at a cost we want and really lock those rates in. And do you, do you think that um, – or have you seen some competition heat up from – 
AI data centers and and kind of the I call those like adjacent competitors, um, or is that still uh, early stage? I think still pretty early stage. Um, we haven't really seen much uh, on our end at this point. Um, and now with Bitcoin over forty thousand, presumably that's going to bring some of the the tourists back, right? Yep. Some, some, yep. The the cyclical. Yep, we're seeing we're seeing some of the availability of the of the second market uh, miners yeah. go up in price a little bit, a little bit less available. Yeah. Um, but it'll it'll come and go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we already placed those orders, right? So we're good. Yes. Yeah, we placed <laughs> we placed for new orders um, quite a while ago and, and locked in those rates. Um, we'll we'll always look at buying uh, miners on the secondary market. You know, we like to keep a contingency fleet. Um, so in the event we have miners going down, we we can we'll call them hot swaps. Mm-hmm. We swap a good miner in its place. We pull that one out and we we repair it and then put one back in. So um, if there's a deal, if the right deal comes up, we'll buy some miners. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, do you th- do you think though that we're we're coming out of the bear market, or do you think that this is just a uh, a, a, a you know a blip? <laughs> I, I don't give professional financial yeah. advice. Let me put this disclaimer. Disclaimer. Yeah. I think we're just seeing the start of it. Yeah. I think I think it's going to get much worse um, over the coming weeks and coming months. Or better. Or better. <laughs> uh, depending on your perspective. Or better. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's still before the halving. Right. Um, and historically, the price runs after the halving. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what 2024 has for, in store for us. We could uh, be looking at an early run right now before the halving. Perhaps, yes. Yeah. Gabe's front running. He's yeah. uh, on Robin Hood, <laughs> hey. loading up. Yeah. yeah, I was actually in Corsicana on Wednesday getting some footage of the new order of miners coming in. So we're already receiving miners in Corsicana, and we were pouring concrete on the first buildings there. So I got to capture all that. That was really fun. How does that look for you, David? Yeah, absolutely. You're exactly right. That's our second large order of miners that um, have come in. We've got tons of equipment. We've got our tanks showing up, our racks showing up. We've got pump skids that we talked about, you know, hundreds of pump skids in Rockdale. We've got that stuff showing up uh, in Corsicana. Yeah, we're, we're pouring concrete. We're, we're building foundations um, and, and just getting ready to gear up to start our deployments here. Yeah, whenever I describe what's going on in Corsicana to friends and family, it's like, they understand that we're building buildings, but I always like to emphasize the infrastructure that has to go in underneath the buildings, like the miles and miles of piping and uh, and wiring and, and all that stuff that has to go in. I mean, what is it like managing all of that and designing all that? It's, it's, it seems almost impossible. Yeah, I'll tell you, we have some of the smartest people that you will ever meet in our engineering uh, and procurement department, engineering, procurement, and construction, um, and they spend you know, months to a year planning a lot of this stuff and procuring materials. I mean, we, we've got, like you said, thousands of feet of pipe that show up on our, our stage in here. And it, I mean, it looks like we are some sort of a Home Depot supplier at some of our, our warehouses. So, um, yeah, lots and lots of planning. Uh, like I said, engineers and, and, and construction managers that are far smarter than me um, that, that plan this stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's very exciting. And do you kind of want to... Make sure you have all the materials so that uh, people can be productive on the site. Yeah, absolutely. It's a balance, right? So you want to make sure you order enough materials so you're not concerned about supply chain and and you're able to keep up with your stages because everything is like a puzzle piece that fits together, right? So, you know, you got to dig the hole first, then the pipe goes in, then the wire goes in, then the concrete. So you don't want to have all your pipe and your wire and everything sitting on the site at one time because it, it can get messy and unorganized. So it's really ordering the right quantities at a time. And when you've put in your first thousand feet of pipe, you've, you know, shortly behind that have the next thousand feet coming in mm-hmm. to set. So it's really a, a, a jigsaw game of, of moving things around and making sure you've got the right, right, right parts where. Yeah. Um, what, when I visited Corsicana recently, what I found astounding was the uh, retaining pond as well. Yeah. Kind of, uh, we're, we're building a lake back there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, arguably going to be the size of a lake it, it's massive um yeah we'll, we're uh it's part of our our um immersion system right to to top off the evaporation for these these large dry coolers so we'll have again have a closed loop of these dry coolers and then in the hot the hot months when we're running water on those evaporative cooling adiabatic coolers we've got to top that water off so we'll pull from that from that lake that yeah lake that we'll right yeah. we'll we'll give it a name right yes uh, yeah we'll come up with something good <laughs> 
Lake David. Yeah, there you go. I'll take it. <laughs> I was thinking Lake Riot, but you yeah. know that seems a little bit too uh, off the off the nose. It's like there's there's probably a better name we could come up with. <laughs> Lake Satoshi. Yeah, yeah, something like that. All I want to you know suggest is that we put some some trophy bass in there so that oh. we can you know do a little maybe. bit of weekend fishing. Maybe, maybe we'll get a shark. We'll get a riot shark or another <laughs> alligator. We could put an alligator in there. <laughs> we got one of those in Rockdale. We got to do something <laughs> a little more a uh, little more new. Let's do a Nile crocodile. <laughs> it's a security feature. Exactly. <laughs> It'll escort you out. To... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So a key part of Riot's corporate strategy is this vertical integration um, to get that lowest cost to mine. Um, how, do, how does that impact, uh, you know, how we build the teams uh, within Riot? Yeah, I think um, our vision at Riot is, right, we want to have a catered experience in every department, right? That's how if you build it yourself and you give these people ownership within those departments, you're going to get such a unique experience and it's going to operate so much more efficiently than anything you've ever seen, right? So within every department, we want to build that, right? So we will hire a professional. Again, that's that's far smarter than me, and we could say it's safety, it's security, it's administration, it's construction, any of those aspects. And we lean on that person to, to help us build this department out and hire professionals that are smarter than them as we step it down. And um, so we really get this, this um, catered experience that we have um, full-time, Riot employees that have the same benefits of, of everybody else in the company, and it really helps us grow, and then we can rinse and repeat, right? So we have our security director is rinsing and repeating what they've built in Rockdale in Corsicana, right. and now in charge of that. So we're not contracting a security company that's going to operate completely different. Your card access is going to read the same way and let you in Rockdale that it does in Corsicana, you're often going to see the same guards because some of them like to move and travel back and mm -hmm. forth. Um, and they're going to have the same mindset and the same positive attitude. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, and so by essentially having it be internal, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, we can look at the cost saving, mm -hmm. but we also have to look at the, the quality essentially, right. right. Of, mm -hmm. of the service, uh, that, that we're building for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's not to say that we don't have outside contractors, though, right? So what's the balance mm -hmm. between having contractors that we work with versus hiring internally and keeping those teams together? Yeah, absolutely. So if it's something that we're doing that is probably not a ongoing, um, regular uh, uh, service that we're going to need, right? If, if it's a specialized um, field in constructing something, whether it's high voltage or electric, electrical or, or a substation, right? We, we don't build substations every day. We don't, we don't deploy high voltage electrical every day. So um, we want to hire industry professionals that have our same mindset, right? So we'll go out and vet these contractors and find one that thinks outside the box. It's very professional, that treats their employees the same way we treat our employees to make sure that it, it's going to mesh and it's going to be a long-term partnership. We don't want to use a different contractor necessary that in course of Canada that we did in Rockdale because we've already learned these people. We, we know how to, how to work with them. They know our safety procedures. They know what we're looking for. They know that we, we care about all the details. So they're already implementing that in the next site. So if it's something specific that we don't need to do on a daily basis, we'll, we'll often contract it out. Um, but if we can save money and it's something we're going to do daily, we want to build it in house if we can. And you know, my mind goes to, um, a couple of different things specifically like you know the training that some of our security officers go through you know i've seen and been a part of a lot of training opportunities where there's jujitsu or, or there's you know range days where we bring in instructors who have a lot of really specialized um you know knowledge in these fields and, and another thing is the echelon front stuff that we do to train our employees and like all that stuff i see as investing back into the people that you've already hired yeah absolutely you know at Riot, our vision is we want to set people up for success, right? I, I want to hire somebody, and I want them to to outlast me here at this company, you know. So our goal is is to is to set people up and provide all these opportunities and real life training. You mentioned security, right? Um, we're not setting a security guard up for success if we don't treat them or we don't we don't teach them hand to hand combat skills, how to retain your gun if somebody grabs it. What do you do if somebody shows up to the site drunk and they're yelling and screaming, right? We want to de-escalate. We don't want to escalate. Um, we want to teach people that if they do get choked from behind or, they, or somebody grabs your arm, like how do you defend yourself and how do we continuously de-escalate a situation? 
if two employees are getting in an argument, how do we come in and help the situation and not escalate it? So that's our goal with everything is we want to set people up, up for success. We want to provide real life training, myself included. You talked about Echelon Front. You know, if, if you gain a skill, you need to be working on it every day to improve it and to hone it, right? And um, ownership is, is probably one of the best skills that you could have and work on on a daily basis. Uh, and it removes barriers, right? You remove ego and you take ownership of everything within your life and at every level within the company, it, it makes just that much of a better place. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's probably one of the, the top benefits of, of working at Riot is uh, get, getting the uh, echelon front uh, mindset of extreme ownership. Um, it, it's it's something that even, even before I joined the company, mm-hmm. um, I, I always enjoyed listening to, to Jocko on mm-hmm. his podcasts and um, the, the ego part, I mean, uh, I, th- I think that's, that's the part I find most challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are always trying to inflate my ego, you know, <laughs> here, you're so great. I'm, I'm sorry, like, I'll stop. I'll yeah, stop. yeah. And, um, yeah, sometimes it, I get sick of hearing that my work is just so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then you get like one negative comment, mm-hmm. which it ruins it. wasn't even intended to be <laughs> negative. It was just <laughs> an offhand remark talking about somebody else. And, and then I take it super personally and, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's and there goes spiraling the out. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, that training uh, has been hugely helpful for, for me, uh, and, and I, I hope that, um, you know, for folks who are looking to work at a company that um, does take that seriously of, hey, we're, we're not here to um, have, like, big titles and, you know, to, to have kind of ego-driven mm-hmm. decisions. No, we're, we're, we're here to build something great, mm-hmm. ha- have a good time doing it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and deliver results uh, for for all of our stakeholders, and and um, so I think the echelon front training. I mean, that's a huge benefit. I could agree more. Yeah, yeah, I, I love it too. I mean, I, one of the takeaways that I have from that training is that everybody, no matter what your position is, as far as you know, the chain of command, everyone's a leader, and you can take ownership for anything that you know happens within work, whether it's it's positive or negative. You know, um, I, but you know, the larger picture behind that is just that that Riot really does take a um, proactive approach to their employees. I think that everything that I've seen, and, and I brag about the company that I work for all the time, it's just it's just such a great place to be because you feel, you know, wanted and, and invested in, and, you know, there's always something new happening within the company that that is just another reason to stick around. Yeah, absolutely. That was my little soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll I'll inflate David's ego, which I, I think of him as like one of the most humble uh, leaders uh, within the company. So um, I'll always appreciate your, your presence and input on uh, everything. And I think I should come to you and ask for more advice on that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'll be happy to offer advice. I can't promise it's going to be good or yeah. the right advice, but yeah. I'll give you something. Well, I can't promise I'll follow through on it. You know, you can lead a horse to water. But... <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Um, Gabe, did you have uh, any last questions before we close it out? No, I think uh, I think that's about it. We're at a uh, fifty-four minutes right now, so I think we're close enough to our hour mark where we can uh, sign off. Yeah, awesome, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us uh, today on Block Time. Thanks, David, for for coming in. Um, this is a really insightful conversation. Covered a lot of different topics, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing our audience next week. So, leave a five-star review. Subscribe. Uh, share with your friends, colleagues, uh, or just uh, Twitter followers. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the next one. Cheers. Mm-hmm.